Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the 505 Podcast. We are back, and it is very clean on this side of town. <laughs> Whoa, dude. Oh. Mr. Clean's in the building. I, uh, I'm, I'm trying out for a new role. I'm going for uh, Aang nice. on Avatar. Yeah. Oh, the, sick, the, sick, the sick. third one that's coming out. And I think it's going to be a big hit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the lead for sure. I really want to be in character, and I think that this is a good first method, step. You do, method actor. Yeah. Did yeah. you do your audition yet? No, I, it's a month away, so I just want—I'm oh. going to keep practicing. Method acting, no. dude. Yeah. Soon you're just going to be standing, and he's just going to be bending air outside. <laughs> I'm excited, bro. Did you guys ever like grow up when you were in the shower? Like, oh, I was for sure. Like, pretend like you were like and the you, like, water let it drip dr- off. Yeah. yeah, 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 big time. Oh, Throwing wow. rocks at your brother. Yeah. You're like earth bending, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Never did that. Lately, I've just been like puddling it in my hands and then just like throwing it on different parts. I don't know. It's just kind of fun. Nice. Yeah. I I, uh, I got a hair transplant mm, and I was going to I was gonna kick it for like two weeks and not do the pod, but I'm like, who the fuck does that? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Power I'm not going to do that. Pod is the fucking You can't move. cover them with anything, right? Like exactly. no hats or nothing. Well, no, I mean, technically you could. So you mm. could. I remember when I walked. Beanie. Yeah. When I walked out, they handed me this the ugliest Navy hat oh. I, and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Mm. Also, first of all, don't put the fucking name of the hair transplant company on the hat. Like, <laughs> right. You think right. I want to wear that? Like, come not on. serving the no, purpose. No. So then when I dipped, I wasn't rocking the hat. And they're like, yo, no hat. I was like, dude, I'm just going to rock it. Yeah. Like, honestly. And I'm happy that I did it. But it's funny because I, I was making a video about this. And I was like, my biggest insecurity, I just basically showed it to the whole world by like doing there you go. doing this Hell transplant. Yeah. And it's not, Um, I'm not dead. I'm okay. Hell yeah. I'm all dude. good. I went into Chipotle. People definitely gave me some looks the first day because there was blood oozing from my mm-hmm. forehead. Still got a little bit. A little bit of dry blood that I can't seem to fucking get off. But um, I'm happy that I did it, and I think that we need more openness in the world. Hell yeah, So dude. I'm just, I'm just gonna, just putting it out to the public, just ripping it. I'm very proud of you. Everyone's Thanks. got stuff. Dude. Everybody's got some shit. Hell yeah. So yeah. today's episode is we're just gonna go around Robin talking about all of our insecurities <laughs> for an hour and a half. <laughs> what is this episode about? Today is about camera basics, but I do, I, I think it's only fair if me and Chase oh, share like an insecurity about ourselves because we mm-hmm. can't let our rock hang. So I'll dude, start. You guys are good guys. Okay. One of my insecurity, I like share too. One is I think that my eyebrows are a little too close to my eyes oh, funny this is silly but i think like brain you got great eyebrows you got oh. great eyebrows too mm. mine are a little too close you got I the think prettiest if were, eyes i think they, the were, if they were a little thought, higher i would have never thought that so that's one god and then can two, let you have that exactly. with the pretty eyes oh, yeah. <laughs> two um i have scoliosis mm. so my body's like legit deformed because my spine is mm. in the shape of an s mm. so like my right pec is significantly bigger than my left and like yeah it just like my body looks deformed and i have really flat feet weird yeah so there's three flat feet that hurts that like is messes you up right i don't know if it doesn't necessarily hurt i just feel like it makes me slightly less athletic Mm. so if i didn't have scoliosis i think i'd be a few inches taller (laughs) and if i didn't have flat feet i'd be probably in the league right now probably the man yeah i uh i got a lot of dandruff god i have a lot of dandruff (laughs) No, I really do. It's crazy, dude. Really? Oh, God. I if I shook my noticed. head right I've now, you would think it was snowing. It's Shut terrible. I'm, you've never noticed? No. I've yeah. never noticed. I need to get like salsa blue or something, dude. It's, it's getting worse. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. It's really bad. So thanks for laughing at my insecurity. But no, there's, no it's, it's bad, dude. Like, it, no, the reason I'm laughing and what's so funny about this is typically... Like people, we all have our insecurities yeah, and our own shit and we think it's the biggest thing mm-hmm. in the world. And then like most times people don't even notice if you bring right. it up to them. Because we're right. probably all, everybody is singularly looking at your own Themselves. stuff, right. not yeah, not what everybody else is doing. So yeah. it's interesting, but I'm really happy to have the two of you here and yes. I'm, I'm happy that we're doing this pod because yeah. this is the highlight of my week and yeah, mine too. to be here with all of you Absolutely. guys and to be with the rocks listening. So yeah. we yeah. got some fucking camera stuff to talk about though and there's... A lot, so, lot of stuff. I was thinking about this because I was fucking, so I was shooting in Quail, which is this big car event. It's like the biggest one. Mm. It's all these private collectors bring their most insane cars. They're worth like 20 millions of dollars because they've all like won Le Mans in 1963 and they're perfectly preserved or mm. whatever. And then like all of these big car manufacturers, only race cars, like Lamborghini, Ferrari, Bugatti, all have big unveiling where they unveil like the new cars there. So then Kia also is there who I was shooting for because they made an electric car, which is actually stupid fast. It, they made it way too. It's a the, the EV6 GT, and it is like zero, it's like this fast as the Taycan, dude. It's insane. Is it like a small car or is it no, an SUV? It, it's like a it's like a it's like a Subaru out like it's like a middle like a hatchback. Does it yeah, have a hatchback? Kinda, 
It's more of like a mm. co- CUV, like they call it, combat SUV, something like that. Okay. Thing rips though. But I was there and I was shooting like on my spare time, shooting some F1 cars because they had, like sick ones. Like oh. Michael Schumacher's Ferrari was there. Like Senna's like car that he crashed, like not the one he crashed, but like it was crazy. I was taking pictures of that. I look up, I see Tucker Doss again. I just run into him all the time for some reason. And I'm just like, I'm going to see you any- everywhere I go now. And he was like talking to me. And then there's just this chipper British man. And I was like, holy shit. That's Jacob, the photographer who I followed my whole life. Mm, me too. And we it was great because one, he loves cars. So we just talked about F1 for a while. He knew all the history. I knew all the history. We were just going back and forth, back and forth. And then it was funny because like he was like pointing at my R5. And I was like, oh, is that the Leica Q2? Because Kosa just bought that. I was like, my boy just bought that. And he's like, oh, I love it. He's like, usually I shoot on that camera. I'm a photographer as well. I'm like, oh, you're a photographer as well. That's interesting. <laughs> what have you shot? Because I'm trying to play it off. You know, I always do. Uh, in, in this hindsight, I'm freaking out. That's funny. Yeah. Oh, you take the photos. Yeah, huh? oh, that's cool. Oh. But I didn't tell him. I didn't tell him that I follow him. I love him or whatever. But it just like, dude, hearing him talk about photography was just cool. And I was just mm-hmm. like, I hope everyone, and not that we're only going to talk about photography, we can talk about videography as well, obviously, but. It's just I hope everyone can do that. I hope everyone can grab a camera and learn how to use it and take cool stuff. So that's what we're going to go through today. I met Jacob a few years ago when I was working at Superb as a host. And he came in and he had his cool accent, you know, and he ordered a coffee and he had a really cool shirt on. And I was Mm. like... I was like, yo, bro, that's a really cool shirt. Like, where'd you get that? And he talks and talks in his accent. I was like, oh, shit. Like, you're not from here. Where are you from? And I think he's from the UK. Yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. super British. And I go, oh, are you here, like, on vacation or, or... visiting or do you live here he goes oh i'm just uh i'm here just like shooting some stuff i go oh you're a photographer like what's your instagram and he's like oh it's just at jacob mm. and i was like you're at jacob mm, what's up bro funny. i fucking love your stuff no and, and hugged it out and then i dm'd him be like yo so nice to meet you didn't respond back but it's all so good. when i met him he i like you know power hug oh hugger, yeah and then i went and then went to jacob I, for whatever reason when i haven't met the person i go like this just habit so i go talk what's up Jacob and then he's like this and I'm like Ugh. and I think we shook hands like that kind of. it was it happens it was not my best but I recovered after that the conversation was pretty good but anyways let's get into camera basics let's yeah. get it baby let's do it shall we I think this is very important because we want to make sure that you guys get the best stuff possible right. yeah we also feel like a lot of people there's a there's a wide spectrum of you guys who listen to our pod you know what I'm saying like some of you guys have been doing this for a minute some of you guys are just starting out the reason why we want to go over camera basics it's not just gear it's how to use a camera maybe we give you some tips on you know when to change the settings when to use a certain lens versus Mm -hmm. another lens um and just give you guys some tips and in hopes that like maybe you take something away from this pot totally so i think the most important and basic thing you need to know is the triangle of exposure so there's three things that determine how exposed or how bright your image is basically and you want to properly expose your image for it to look correct in photo and video so you have three things which is aperture iso and shutter speed and we're going to go through all of them i'll talk about aperture first basically it determines how wide that hole is in your lens that lights light through onto your on your sensor right Mm -hmm. and so the obviously the wider the hole which is the lower the f-stop which gets kind of confusing means you're letting more light in per image, right? So like so F2.8 right. is brighter, brighter than... F22. Okay, got F2. it. F2.8, much brighter, and mm-hmm. it's wider hole. Mm-hmm. It also has some effects where like F2.8, a wider hole means shallower depth and field, so depth of field, so less stuff is in focus. So mm-hmm. if I like took a photo of Kosas at F2.8 right now, like just his face would be in focus and like where he's sitting, but like the couch would be blurred as shit. Mm-hmm. But if I took a picture of him at F22, it would, for one, it would be a lot darker, so mm-hmm. we'd have to bring in a lot more light, But the whole, the couch would be in focus. He would be in focus. The table in front of him would have to be in focus. And there are different times when you want to play with both of those because they both have appropriate meanings. Not F1.8 is not always the best, kids. You Mm got to remember that. It's important to think about. So question. So the aperture is affecting depth of field. Mm -hmm. It's affecting how light or dark our image is. Mm -hmm. And what, what I mean, depth of field and focus, kind of the same situation. That's about it. That's about it. Okay. Right. There it is. I I think so. I (laughs) sure sure, sure do hope so. We do that. We get paid to do this, huh? (laughs) I think, yeah, and you, I think you really want to hit on that last one, though, how he said that we all, we shouldn't all be shooting at F1.8 or F2.8. Yeah. I think a common thing that a lot of people do when they get the new lens, they finally spend the two grand on that, mm-hmm. that holy grail lens, mm-hmm. and it's F2.8. And then every single shot has a totally. blurry background and it looks silly. Sometimes it's really interesting to have just a little bit in focus and it like draws your eye to a certain mm. something and tells what you want to say. 
But like with cars, for example, you got to shoot at least like f seven point one or higher, or else not the whole car will be in focus and it looks stupid. Oh, right. Okay. The back of the car will be blurry, and you don't want that because the car that. goes back long. But if you're shooting like portraits, it looks really nice if like just the eyes are in mm-hmm. focus. It's kind of flattering. So you got to know when to use what. What are some examples of when you would want to? I guess we product photography, product photography and cars, crowds, sports. Probably you want to get like the whole team in focus, not just one guy. Yeah, you're kind of swapping in between, maybe wide open or five yeah, or seven yeah. or whatever. Landscapes as well. Mm. Yeah, because you want the whole. You don't want just like one, unless. And then again, there's always rules to be broken, right? Like mm-hmm. sometimes cars, you just want like the rear view mirror because that's like new on the car to be in focus. That's kind of interesting. So you got to kind of guess and play around with what but it's important to know these settings so that you can break the rules it's nice when you use both in a video totally. or with photos as well mm-hmm. for example mm-hmm. like sports for example an um an example that comes to mind is like okay let's say you're shooting at a high aperture at f11 to get the whole crowd in focus but then you want to focus on one single player like lebron mm. like that draws emphasis to that totally. single mm-hmm. player so like you're going to shoot that at a much shallower mm-hmm. um depth of field yeah yeah totally completely agree number two we have iso mm-hmm ISO stands for your camera's sensitivity to light. So basically what you're doing, this number usually starts out at 100 and it can go uh, pretty damn high depending on the camera system that you have. But like say a Sony might be like 30,000 or Mm 100,000, something ridiculous. The Canons might go up to maybe 5,000. So it just kind of depends on your different situation. And, you know, general rule of thumb, the higher we go up on that number, 100, 200, 300, 400, we're making our camera more sensitive to light. So if there's any, you know, if we were outside super dark street, are we going to want our camera to be very sensitive to the light? Cause there's nothing else. Right. We don't have a sun. We just have some stop lights or whatever. So you're going to probably bump that number up pretty high, but it's very important to remember that when you do bump up ISO, you're also adding in grain mm-hmm. and every single camera has a different threshold for where they're adding in grain, whatever that number might be for the cannons. For example, after 1600 ISO, it looks pretty shitty. And then with the Sony's, for example, we could get to what's the high ass number that, you have, that ISO can go to, like 120,000. Well, Sony, the new Sony's are interesting because it's so the new Sony's have dual native ISO, which means which means this is the best number ISO of the image that your camera will produce. So, for example, um, on the Sony, it's 640 is the base best ISO, mm-hmm. and then you can also get up to 12,800. Which is actually insane because mm. there was one time when I shot Night Tales. Shout out Night Tales. Nice. They're sick Great band. fucking night. Dude. Yeah. So we went to a club in Hollywood. Me and Chase went and I shot. It was my literally my first time shooting anything music related. And I didn't bring an LED light. And we get to the club and I'm like, wow, it is so dark in here. And I look at the image and I'm at like... 1600 like 3200 iso i go dude this is like way too dark i can't see shit in here Mm. so i was like well fuck it i have the a7s3 let me try to try this Mm -hmm. dual native iso out i had never tried it and i looked good on my camera but i was like hail mary let's pray to god and it's crazy too because you got so he's like it's like, you know, 1600, 3200. It's like mm-hmm. slowly getting a little more grainy. And then you were at like 11,600 and grainy as fuck. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then when you got to like 12,800, 800, which is like just the fire. dual native, that's Bang. like the other native, it was just perfect again. No like, grain. Just like, just like 100. I don't know insane. if we've ever, I don't know if I've ever showed you, you this showed, footage. You showed it, it to was me. Crazy. Were you dancing? It was yeah. black and white? Yes. Yeah, it was sick. <laughs> yeah. I was dancing yeah. a whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> I was dancing black and white and color, all sorts, dude. <laughs> But it was, um, it's very impressive what Sony has done with the dual native ISO. So yeah, bumping our ISO increases exposure, lower f-stop increases exposure. So if you want to shoot at a high f-stop, you might have to increase your ISO because high f-stop lowers your exposure, but high ISO will bring it back to normal. And the reason why this is like a triangle is because all of these three things work interchangeably. Totally. Mm-hmm. And like, if you change one, you you're to. gonna have to change the mm-hmm. other. Exactly. And the last thing I want to say is, cause I just learned this today, I thought it was funny. ISO stands for International Organization of, for Standardization. And basically, they just like make standardized tests for lighting measurements mm. and other kind of measurements. And for whatever reason, it got named after, after them. I think it's based off of film because mm. there's like 400 ISO film, 800 oh, ISO okay. film. And that's like just like where it's set constantly. You can't change it with film. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Interesting stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right. When you're shooting film photography, whatever the number is after like the name of mm. the film, for example, like Portra 400, mm. you have to set your 
camera yeah. to 400 ISO and you can't change it. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. got it. Yeah. Very interesting. I just right? think of ISO as artificial light. The yeah. higher that number is, yeah. the more light like you're electronically coming Yeah, we're electronically putting. adding it in there. Yeah, exactly. Making the camera more sensitive. Next up, we got <sighs> shutter speed. Ooh, good one. Okay, I can talk about it. With photo and video, they're different, but I'll yeah. do it with video and then you okay. can talk about photo. Cool. Okay. With video, so there's usually 24 frames in our little, in our deal, right? So what we're, we're seeing right now, if you, you're looking left to right, it's pretty much like 24 frames per second. It's mm -hmm. real time. So what your camera has got to do is every single one of those little tiny frames, one through 24, it has to expose them to light. I believe it's changed a lot because of digital and film, but I know that with back in the day or whatever, every single frame is getting exposed to a certain percentage of light. That's why that number one over mm -hmm. whatever, one over 125, one over 50. That's how, mm -hmm. how long we're exposing each little frame to light and then it continues on. And so what's, a, can, what's a rule behind that? If you're yeah, at 24? yeah. If we're, there's a rule with, um, with shutter speed, because if you were to get in a situation where say you go home, you got to make sure that these numbers are correct. So if we're shooting at 24 frames per second, there's a rule in the film world called the 180 degree shutter rule that states that your shutter speed should always be double your frame rate. But like we said earlier, rules are meant to be broken sometimes. Mm -hmm. So with sports specifically, if we were shooting at 60 frames per second, the rule would say that our shutter should be one over 120. Mm -hmm. But with sports, when you slow it down, the ball won't be perfectly right, sharp. Be It'll be a little blurry because it's moving faster than those frames are capable of picking up. So what you got to do is you got to crank the shutter just a little bit. And if you ever hear somebody say, crank the shutter, that just means bumping that number up. So instead of one over 120, maybe it's one over 180 or one over 210. We're making that number faster. Exactly. It's a, it's a smaller, if you divide one over 50, that whatever that number right. is one over 125 we're getting small we're getting a way smaller yeah. number you know and again it like equates to light so mm -hmm. the faster the shutter the higher that one over number is the less light is going to bring in because the shutter's open only open Just for a tiny, exactly, yeah, tiny little bit exactly but if you have a longer shutter like one over 48 like if you're shooting 24 frames per second it'll be a little brighter and you'll have to like maybe take down your f-stop or take down your iso to compensate and something interesting i remember the first time i ever shot a music festival I went in there thinking, okay, slow-mo, because that's going to look sick and cinematic. Like, that's mm -hmm. what I should do. So I put my camera in. I had the Sony a6500, which is a crop sensor camera, which mm -hmm. isn't great in low light. Mm -hmm. And I put it to 120 frames per second. Mm -hmm. So therefore, my shutter would have needed to be double, so 1 over 240. Mm -hmm. But when you're in that situation, it's dark as shit like that. I was shooting myself in the foot when I should have been at 24 and you give yourself so much more light because you got to think about the whole triangles adjusting. Our shutter speed's way mm -hmm. a smaller number. It's going to give us more light, which is great for everybody. And if our frame rate is a smaller number, that'll also give us more light because right. it changes the whole entire situation on the triangle. Right. So go. what you should do is you should go look at the exposure triangle right now, kind of follow along with it as we talk totally. about it because I feel like it'll make a lot more sense. A few things with shutter speed as well. One time I was filming a concert, actually a few times. I fucked this up a few times before I figured it out when I was first starting to shoot concerts. I was shooting everything at 60 frames a second. So my shutter speed was one over 125. Mm -hmm. I was getting these weird lines oh. on my footage mm -hmm. and I didn't understand why. I was like, oh my God, my camera's broken. I asked Spencer Shipman, I go, dude, why am I getting these lines on my footage? He goes, well, the light of the production is me like the frequency is yeah. different and so it's causing the li those lines you're gonna have to drop your shutter mm -hmm. speed whenever i see those lines on my screen i just don't shoot slow-mo it right. sucks because like obviously you're gonna want to like slow down your footage if you want in post but sometimes like it's not worth it to me right. i'd rather shoot mm -hmm. at 24 and not have oh, those right. lines mess up the footage than be able to slow it down and have it look like not or else as it's good. like unusable i think is what it is is the lights so lights are constantly like flashing light they're mm -hmm. not actually yeah. constantly yeah, light exactly. um and so when you have a really fast shutter when you're shooting slow motion because when you're 120 frames per second you have to shoot at one over 240 which mm -hmm. is really fast it's like picking up like the when this not flash basically because when, when you use the strobe light you can't have a fast shutter you can't do like usually you can't do like one over i want to say like i think it's five. 125 right yeah or yeah you can yeah, go pretty slow with a, with a with a strobe unless it's a really good strobe oh. because it like catches up and if you shutter like too fast it'll get just like half of the the light hitting it oh, before which is really interesting i actually just got a new on camera flash and i have it at ttl which is just like automatic because it's just like much easier to use. It won't even let me crank the shutter speed past 250. 
Mm. I was like, what the heck is going on? But the reason it does it is because if it goes faster, the image will be all messed up. Mm -hmm. Another thing, speaking of on-camera flash, this is something that I love to do where I'm breaking the rules with shutter speed and flash. So concert photography, what I do is I'll take my shutter speed down to about one fifth of a second. So slow shutter. Which is with like, photography, yeah, it's like boom, boom. boom. Uh -huh. And you're letting in a lot more light that way. Yeah, then you have to compensate by dropping the ISO or bumping the aperture. In this case, I'm doing both. Typically, I'm shooting aperture 2.8 and mm -hmm. ISO around like 1600 to 3200 when it comes to photos. But when I drop the shutter speed down to like one fifth of a second, I'll then crank my aperture to about F 5.6 to 7.1 and my mm -hmm. ISO down to 100, which you're like, that's weird to do in a club. But because the shutter speed is much slower and the flash goes off, what I do is like, I'll take a photo on a zoom lens. So I'll be at like 30, I'll have like my 16 to 35 on. Mm -hmm. I'll start at 35, I'll click the shutter, the flash will go off and oh, I'll fine. zoom out. But because you're at f like 5.6 to 7.1, your subject is really in focus, mm -hmm. but the sides of it mm -hmm. are like warpy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it gives a really cool effect. And that's something that I learned from a photographer in Cleveland. He was like showing me some photos mid show and he was, I was like wondering what he was doing, zooming in and out with the flash. And he taught me how to do it. And ever since then, I try to get a few of those kinds of yeah, shots every sick. time I shoot. And it's just something that like separates your photography because totally. it looks way different. And people mm -hmm. are like, how the heck did you get that? And it's all in camera. Right. That's sick. sick. With flash and slow shutter, if you're shooting parties and you have like lights, anything with like nightclub, it looks really cool. So if you're in, in uh, nightlife photography, party mm -hmm. photography, wedding photography, like right. during night, mm -hmm. like try out some slow shutter with flash photography because you can get some really cool effects and using the flash enables you to like stop the motion of the person to ha have them be in focus and crisp mm -hmm. but like the stuff moving around them it, it's it gives a weird effect it's you should uh, try it out if you've never tried slow shutter with flash photography so shutter speed especially in photography gives you like the most room for experimentation and like you can get real funky with shutter speed in photography so like Time lapses, for example, when you shoot them right, like photo, they're all photos, and you want to have like a, a slower shutter so that there is some motion blur, so it almost mm -hmm. looks like a video, you know what I mean? Because when it's sped up, then yep. it looks like kind of normal. When you're shooting cars driving, like a classic tip is shooting your shutter one over the miles per hour that they're going. Oh, you told me which this. Which is a good one. So like if you're going 50 and you're uh -huh. it's like, you're going 50 in your follow car or what the picture car, mm -hmm. and then or the camera car, sorry, and then the picture car, the car you're taking photos of, is also going 50 miles per hour. If you shut your shutter to one over 50, because the car isn't changing relative to where you're changing, the car will be sharp, but like the ground and the trees That's around sick. you will be blurred as fuck. And it makes it look like it's going like a million miles per hour, which just looks cooler. Yeah. If you take a photo of a car driving and you have a fast shutter, it does not look very cool. When you're doing the car stuff, are yeah. you always doing that? Or is there times where you do get everything in focus? If I'm shooting a car driving fast, yeah, I, I'm always doing that basically. Wow. If it's not moving, I, then I don't want it to be anything blurry. And that's when you get like those detail shots, mm -hmm. the features they want. But like if they're driving, they just want their car to look like it's moving. And it just looks kind of weird. It just looks like not because because of all the car as you've seen, it just doesn't look right. It looks stupid Got for it. some reason. I will say, though, the reason why these camera basics are so important, the reason why you want to know about how your camera works and like being able to shoot in manual mode as opposed to just relying on auto is because once you know the rules, mm -hmm. you can figure out right. when and right. how to break them. Right, totally. Because that rule, would that's or what I just said, would be you wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. And auto would never do it for you. No. It never just guess, oh yeah, yeah, he's probably shooting a car and he wants yeah, everything to be exactly. blurry except for the car. You can also do like cool stuff with like waterfalls or rivers. Mind you, you should have your camera on a tripod or like a stabilizing mechanism because if you are shooting a shutter slower than like one over really 125 it's gonna be kind of blurred because your hands are shaking so if you take like a put your camera on a tripod take a picture of a waterfall with like a one second shutter the water is just gonna look like a beautiful like just like flowing sheet it's creamier of, mm -hmm. it's creamy it looks crazy that's how they get those shots if you were wondering photo formats mm -hmm. we got raw and jpeg bang and can you guys maybe tell me like if my camera can shoot raw mm -hmm. why would i ever shoot 
in JPEG? It's a great question. And yeah. I, I think uh, you want to go? You want to take I mean, a stab? Take a stab. The answer is like, if you got space, fucking shoot raw every time. <laughs> totally. You, just get, you, <laughs> get way more, you get way more information. So you can take the highlights down. You can take the shadows up. Mm. And so like, say you're taking a picture of like a sunset, but you want like the river that you're taking on the foreground to also be exposed. You could like darken the whole thing. So the sunset's in focus, take a picture in raw and then bring up the shadows because in raw, this is another little tip. You can burn out highlights and you'll never get them back. Like if, if you go too bright, you can't get them back, but you can always bring up the stuff that's too dark. Mm-hmm. So expose, especially if you're going for that look, expose for the thing that's really bright and then bring up the shadows later. That's really important. And you can really only do that in RAW. JPEG, there's not as much information. It's harder, but it is a lot sp- smaller file size, mm-hmm. which is nice if you only have a four gigabyte memory card like that one fucking That one did. time, yeah. yeah. I never would do that ever again. <laughs> one of the things that the guy at the Leica store was telling me, because I was asking about this like JPEG versus RAW stuff, he said the reason why photographers who use Leica will use their JPEGs and I feel like a lot of photographers who use like a will shoot JPEG is because like the image already looks so good out of camera and oftentimes they'll just like take photos, get on their phone and like post it. And with that kind of camera, it just needs way less like post production. Right. And it looks so pretty yeah. about it. But um, I, I typically just always shoot raw for the most part. The only yeah. the reason I can think of, like I remember when I was in Oregon, I couldn't figure this out because the sports people were always in JPEG. I'm like, why are you guys in JPEG? And mm-hmm. apparently for them, it's because a lot of the time sports people, if they work for a news situation or they're with um, Getty, for example, Getty's shooting every single game there ever was known to mankind. And they're hardwired in via a line oh, to crazy. to a server. So they have this yellow cord, the Getty guy that's on the floor, and it goes all the way up somewhere. And there's a person at the top with a laptop mm. and they're hardwired into whatever that person is shooting. And so that way, if it was raw, it wouldn't upload fast enough because mm. they're spraying. They're just right. boom, got the shot. Okay, next play. The person up there is like, oh, I like number six, nine, ten. And then someone else is pulling them, editing them really quick, <laughs> posting them up. Because the Getty images are always just like there. Like just every time, every time. They're also not edited like mm-hmm. if, no, not at all. all or like crazy. Like it's not stylized at all. No. It's just like no. capturing the moment versus getting a stylized photo. I, I didn't know this, but in college we had this professor and he was explaining to us like first day. He goes, if you manipulate an image, like you're ruining it. Da, 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 da. And I was like, I don't think that's true. But in news and in that's right. why that's why that's a thing. So like if you ever see um, something like you just said from a publication, it's never, ever edited unless they'll maybe bump the contrast a little bit mm. or something like black, white contrast, something like that. And that's because it's supposed to look like if we were there. You're not supposed to mess with any, I can't remember the specific word, but any of the, whatever is in that frame is there in the frame. I get it. I get you know, it. Because it's like, it's you're not trying to manipulate the world into seeing something. Exa- like exactly. And so people get fired all the time. They lose their complete career. He was explaining to this day one. I was like, that's just such cap. But it's true. Yeah, I bet. It's dude. true. If you manipulate any photo and you're a photojournalism major, or I'm not major, but if you're in the photo yeah. J world, you're fired. Oh, I bet. And they have a software to like figure it out and everything. Wow. It's pretty crazy. I had no idea. So, wow, so all these all these creative or i don't know if you'd call it creative but whatever we do like Mm -hmm. if we went and i took out somebody in my picture nobody's gonna freak out they're gonna give me a thumbs up but if you do it and you were in getty they'd be like you're done because you could photoshop the news and fuck the whole world yeah or something yeah Yeah. exactly it's crazy you know who's really good at manipulating images jacob Jacob. yeah god he's good at it dude unbelievable about photoshop what i will say there's a trick that if you are worried about space Mm -hmm. um shooting raw you can create a folder. Let's say you pull up your Lightroom and you pull your selects and you can make a separate folder of just your selects. Mm. And then on your hard drive, it automatically brings them to an, like your selects to another folder. Clutch. So then you can just like delete the photos oh, that you don't crazy, use. Yeah, dude. Well, they'll have to DM you on that. the gram if they yeah. want to learn how to yeah, do that. Yeah, make a little that's, tip. That's um, very interesting. I have now. a quick camera tip that is actually um, important that we forgot to mention. Give it. Color temperature that's Ooh. in the camera. And I have been reading the ASC, the American S- Society of Cinematography Manual. Oh, you've read that book. Uh, I'm reading it. I'm getting there. It is thick. It's more of like a... Shout it. You thick. don't like read it. It's not like a read. It's more like a, oh, I haven't shot underwater miniatures in a long time. Let me look up that chapter. Oh, chapter 17. You know what I mean? But he was explaining color temperature and I never realized why it's portrayed the way it is so it's all like it's always like 5600 k mm-hmm. calvin mm-hmm. right i never knew why i didn't know what that meant basically calvin like is like fahrenheit or yeah. celsius you know it's a color temperature yeah. or it's a temperature measurement uh-huh. and it's basically if you light a flame lower 
right? Because like 3200 Kelvin, if you set the lights to that, they would be... No, sorry, I'm talking about the camera. Sorry, oh, I'm talking about the sorry, camera. Sorry. So, so let me focus. So if you set that to the camera, then everything would look yellow because it thinks that it is going to be... You're going to have blue light to expose white. When you light a flame, like a fire, a lower, a less hot fire is like orange. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But if you crank it up, it comes blue. And it's literally the temperature that fire's burning in Kelvin. And that's how they determined that whole range. I had no idea about that. Isn't that wow. crazy? I thought it was always the sun. I just thought it was like a random thing. That was like the sun. They're going off the sun. 5600 yeah. is the sun. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. I was like, yeah, so that's the sun. like the sun, man. <laughs> that right. is the sun. Because, and it's weird because it's backwards. Because your camera is doing the opposite of what of what the lighting is doing to try to make white, right? Because that's our cameras are very bad at distinguishing the color white. That's why yeah. you have to white balance. Right, right. So white balance is really important. You can go blue or yellow, blue or yellow. You don't really have to know why, but that just blew my mind. I thought the nerds out there would care. Mm. Another tip. Well, you always want to set your white balance to a specific temperature because mm. I, was, do auto. I was sometimes don't doing do auto, auto back don't in the day it. and it, it messed it up. One thing you can do auto when I was shooting real estate, I would do auto when I was going yeah. from inside uh-huh. to outside. Yep. If you're shooting real estate, you can use auto ISO to, you know, have your image look good on the inside as you're moving outside. That's just like a hack. Absolutely. Let's oh. talk about video formats. Ooh. Let's do it. Okay. Well, back when we start, when I started, 1080p was like the start of it all. Mm-hmm. And then we got into this 4K thing. Mm-hmm. And 4K basically is just, it's just a wider a wider frame. I think it's four times the four amount of times, pixels. So 1080 by 1920. That's the that's size like, of the like frame. It's like 1K. It's like 1K. We'll yeah. call it 1K. Yeah. And then 4K is just four times it. So you can imagine you got a lot more information to play with. And when you're shooting in 4K, something that's cool that you can't do in 1080 is if you like messed up a frame mm-hmm. in 4K, you got a lot of wiggle room to work with. Mm-hmm. Like we Chase just said, it's four times bigger. So I could scale it in. I could zoom in a little bit, move the frame around however I like it. And it doesn't look blurry as shit. But if right. you did that with 1080 footage and good. you zoom in just a little bit, you're losing all kinds of data because there's just not, there's not a lot there. And if you're watching like a movie or whatever, they're shooting a lot of these movies in like 8K mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So if the editor gets back and goes, oh, great interview, but it'd be cooler if it was balanced in and moved over, they can do that. Right, which it is a really good tip for interviews, especially mm-hmm. if you're shooting it alone. Yep. If you have to shoot an interview alone, shoot it in 4K and put it in a 1080 timeline. Yep. And then you can have like your wide, you can have like your tight and just zoom in. You can it. have a like, medium. You yeah. can have it to normal. You could go medium. You could push them on the left of the frame and yeah. zoom it in. It's really helpful. I also think though, you have to keep in mind that a lot more space again if you're shooting 4k it's like it's just like raw versus jpeg like shooting Mm -hmm. 4k versus 1080p it's just going to take up a lot more space and if you're shooting 4k slow-mo like 4k 60 or 4k 120 more space it's going to be even more space and also you got to keep in mind for my sony specifically i shoot on a, a sony a7s3 it's capable of shooting 4K 120, but you need a specific memory mm-hmm. card for it. It's a tough card and it literally costs like 300 something dollars. And then you need the the card reader because it's not a regular SD card, which is like another fucking $160. Right. So like mm-hmm. just to be able to shoot 4K 120 on a Sony A7S III, you've got to shell out $500. I did it because no dents, but like... <laughs> Dude, it's just Brutal. a lot of expensive. It's, it's a lot of those little things add up on the camera. But yeah. let's talk about like cinematic. Slow-mo B-roll, being able to shoot 4K 120, a lot of people are like, yo, that looks so sick. It's so mm-hmm. cinematic just because it's freaking Myth bust slow, me cinematic. What is, what, what is, they've ruined this whole term for they us. Have. The whole community of camera people. And I, we're going to debunk it today. There are all sorts of terms that are just ruined. We're going to we're gonna debunk cinematic today. Yeah. We'll let everybody know how to properly use it, what it even means, and... Yeah, the whole yeah. nine yards. Well, I think like a few years ago when that slow-mo B-roll mm. had its phase, mm-hmm. like you you heard the word like cinematic slow-mo B-roll being thrown out all the time. And really it was just like, oh, this is a shot of me doing whatever in 4K slow-mo and like it's quote unquote cinematic yeah, because I'm, it's slow-mo. Yeah, and I'm just walking my dog or whatever the fuck. Yeah, yeah a perfect example of this, not to shit on them, but I kind of will. Come on. You know the watch company movement? Yeah. Mm. Remember how like they would go in a helicopter and then mm. you would put like hand? your hand slow-mo. out slow-mo, slow-mo to show off the watch like, yo, it's cinematic. It's dope as fuck. Like, think yeah. about it. No, Change it's not it. cinematic. Yeah. yeah. So I it's think- cinematic the first time, maybe. Yeah. 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 The first time and then 4,000 people right. ruined it. But this is interesting because you can have, I remember I was talking with some people that are on my little team right now and they were saying that they're like, dude, if I put it in 60, that makes it cinematic. I'm like, no, see, we ruined, they ruined mm-hmm. this for they everybody. Ruined they ruined it. Cause you can have a 24 
frames per second clip that's just real time and it could look super cinematic mm-hmm. it could look gorgeous so i think that we're going to debunk kind of how what cinematic means so i i think number one it's the frame mm-hmm. so if you could look at the frame and i could say damn i would take a picture of that and i would put it up on the wall and it would right. stand alone as a photo right i think that qualifies it a yeah. portion of it is being yeah. cinematically important. shot yes important give me number two you just have a motivated and directional light Thing is really important mm. don't just have like if you just put someone on the couch and you have the house lights on it's not gonna look cinematic but if you have like oh the sun is setting so it's over there and you like bring in a light and it has like a direction and it's motivated mm-hmm. by the sun so it's not just like random lighting mm-hmm. that really helps to make them stand out and it's not just like your normal daily life it's actually something that's curated and cinematic soft light is also a big thing so if you're shooting both photography or video Lean into shooting more either during sunrise or sunset. Mm -hmm. I don't know how early riser you guys are, but sunset probably. So yeah, sunset, (laughs) golden hour. Yeah, don't make me do that. Yeah, but um, it's always better to shoot when the light is softer because it's just more flattering and more quote unquote cinematic on your subject. So Mm -hmm. when is the light softer? When the sun is rising and when the sun is setting. If it's middle of the day, it's going to be much harsher light. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have to shoot during the midday where the light is super harsh. Two things. One, either find shade because it's much more even Mm -hmm. lit. Mm -hmm. Or two, use a reflector. Or a diffusion, yeah, like a Mm. scrim. Or backlight them. It looks looks good. So put put sun, whatever, subject, and then you. And you can also, the thing is, uh, talking about cameras, a nicer camera, like a super expensive camera, can expose for both the brighter and the darker. And sometimes it actually looks kind of cool in the middle of the day. Uh, Lena was telling me, King Richard... All day scenes, no lights, no nothing. No way. All just pure daily life. They shot in a nice ass camera, and it's just it has it's contrast. Got it's that. gritty. Yeah, you're so right. And that's what they wanted. Yeah, it's not it, it's cinematic, but it, it's a different kind of cinematic. Mm-hmm. It's not like I don't know. It's, it's it was a, de- a decision by them again because they knew all the things and they chose to broke the rules. <laughs> there okay? it is. But <laughs> listen, dude, if you have a lot of money, just go get a really nice camera, yeah. and, and you then don't like you're, and then this. just don't yeah, just yeah. don't listen to this pot. Yeah. The other thing too, I think that makes something cinematic is the actual design of Mm -hmm. where you're shooting at whether you got a nice set that you drew up or like all all of the things in our scene is called mise-en-scene the lights the actors the wardrobe like every little nitty-gritty thing that we pick out to be in the scene is the mise-en-scene and and that's what makes it cinematic that's That's what makes right the whole that's the whole nine yards that's everything encapsulating that is what makes it cinematic not not the lens that you pick not the aperture not the shutter speed right not, Totos. Not. To, I was thinking about this, and I'm not to shit on him, and I won't mention shit it, on him. No, I'm not gonna. So, say if I'm taking a picture of a car, right? Mm-hmm. And I like get it. I'm like, oh, I want it to be set up there because the light's coming here, and then I'm gonna have this person standing next to it there. That's pretty interesting, etc. Mm-hmm. And then I say I did that, and then I had to go shoot a video thing. So then someone else like took the picture. That's still my picture. For you know sure. what I'm saying? You yeah. just hit the button, right? Yeah, for sure. And you, sure, you expose it right, and that's great. But like the setup is what the whole it's the mm-hmm. whole thing. That's my setup, and that's that goes further than just hitting the button. So true. Yeah, and that's so that's really important. That's something you should focus more on just getting the camera settings right. Is getting the fucking mise en scène right. You know who does that really well? Henry, the XX guy, oh, yeah, he does, he does that super well. And I remember it was funny that you just said that because in Oregon one day it snowed and then we went to the field and took snow photos. And Henry told me exactly where to stand. And I took the picture. I go, dude, you didn't tag me in the photo. He goes, I took that picture. Yeah. And I go, why well, took it? He goes, I took the picture. Yeah. And I was like. You're so right. You have said <laughs> every damn setting. That's, like, funny. So that's funny that you said that because now like years later thinking about it, it's like, oh, Henry for sure took that <laughs> picture. I had nothing to do with it. I simply just went ka yeah. I was yeah. like, there you go, brother. It's interesting. You also have to remember that like in movies, mm-hmm. everything that is in that frame, set design, mm-hmm. like totally. down to the very minor details is there for a reason. It's mm-hmm. not a mistake. Right. Mm-hmm. Never. Unless and, it's a Starbucks cup in Game of Thrones. Nice. <laughs> sure. <laughs> How's the dragon just came out? I can't wait to watch it. So it did. It's really good. I watched. Shit. I watched it last oh, night. Hell yeah! And on top of that, you know, sound and color definitely play Big a, time. a role in yeah. making something cinematic. I think that color could ruin it or it could make it. And you know, and if you guys are interested in, about the stuff, we could go to Camera Basics too. We could also just do like a a lighting. We could also just do like mm. a sound and color podcast. So just let us know, please. I love it. Yeah, let's move on to lenses. Ooh. Glass. Ooh. I love glass. People say the glass is more important than the body, and I agree. It's because like, it just, it looks sharper. It looks clearer. You can do more with it. You can make people feel more stuff. But let's let's get into the nitty gritty. So 
typically if you're deciding between lenses, you're not saying that we're going to get it because we're not doing equipment right now, but like you should know when to use a wide angle and when to use a telephoto. Kostas, when do you choose? It depends on what I'm trying to shoot. Totally. For example, if you're trying to make something look grand and epic, like a concert from the crowd, I'm gonna shoot on a wide angle. But if I wanna shoot more detail and get more like emotion out of someone, I'm gonna shoot on a telephoto. That's just me specifically shooting concerts. It's also really cool because you can shoot the same shot at different focal mm. lengths to achieve two different looks. For example, if I'm shooting, if I'm in the crowd and I'm shooting the stage, right. I can shoot at a wide angle to show like the entire venue, the Whoa, production, everything. Mm. And then I can also take my telephoto lens and I can shoot through the hands of people and show loud luxury, like the details of their right. face. It's the same moment, but it, it evokes two different emotions and you're trying to show two different things. And because with wider angle, things not only are farther because it's wide, but look further from each other mm. because it like really accentuates that. So like it would seem like the crowd is fucking massive if you shot it on a super wide lens because it feels like there's so much space between you and the DJ. But if you like shoot on a telephoto, it's much more compressed. It compresses everything. So like if there was like a skyscraper behind like a mile behind the stage and there's the stage and there's the hands, it almost looks like it's all like kind of flat, which can look really fucking cool but yeah important to know when to use which yeah it's very interesting one of my favorite things to do with a wide angle lens is just a wide angle low shot if you go like 12 mil or 16 mil and you get real low this is like really cool for fashion you can have them like kick out a mm. foot in front or like just do crazy uh like poses if you're shooting models and if you're low and wide one it makes them it like puts the model in a very like powerful position sure. and it's just like a really cool look because if you're the wider you get the more distorted the image is gonna look and like sometimes that's a really dope look absolutely yeah there's just so many things you can do you can also like use like so you're shooting a wide angle it also like accentuates what you're kind of looking at and it also yeah like i said makes it bigger so like okay let's go through examples real estate wide as fuck because you want to make the space look big mm -hmm. you want to make things look fur away from each other don't shoot a wide angle with a portrait this is not pc but my brother spencer we had our cousin who's a great guy but he shot his senior photos on a, like a fisheye lens because he takes photos of actual fish, which is funny. Um, <laughs> swear to God. And, and he took all the senior photos of my brother, like portraits. So my mom's friend said, wow, Spencer looks so stupid. Uh, and which was really mean to say about Spencer. He's not stupid. Yeah, but it was nice. just taken on the wrong lens. You should take portraits on telephoto, at least like, honestly, bro, like, if you're going to do the face like 50 mil or higher because mm. it it flattens their features, it's very flattering and it, it also has that nice shallower depth of field because the longer the lens, the more shallow depth of field you have, which is nice for portraits. Another really cool thing with video is like a parallax effect you can do. Mm. And this, okay, for example, in movies, right? A helicopter shot on like a telephoto lens or like a drone now like DJ has having features on the drone where like you can zoom in right. and get so like if you're doing a, a wraparound shot mm. the background is yeah, nice. like moving but like the stuff that's in focus your subject is in the pos in like the same position yeah. and it gives a really cool sit going back to cinematic yeah. really cool cinematic effect that yeah if you get movement on a telephoto lens it, it looks, looks really cool because you get more parallax the stuff like like you know this shots at the end of free solo when they have like the drone and alex honnold's like on the top oh, of the yes. mountain yeah those are shot on like a longer lens of which is crazy for the drone and then it makes it look like just the whole world is spinning around mm -hmm. him so fast and you wouldn't get that if it was wider angle which is really cool. On top of lenses, you can also put things on them mm -hmm. that help out, make your image look a little cleaner, can make it a little, little darker. There's Give you more flexibility. More flexibility. So one of my favorite ones that actually comes in my C70, it comes Huge. with it, comes Huge. with it, are ND filters. Mm -hmm. Now these are neutral density filters. Basically all these are is just a shade for your lens. They're just like a pair of sunglasses, the slap on the end. Some Ray-Bans. And yep. they're variable. So mm -hmm. you can change You know how much more or how little that we're adding on how, to the like, end. darker you're making it. Exactly, and all you're doing is making the image darker or lighter so you can change all of those things that we talked about in your exposure right. triangle to make, this is what I want my shot. I want it to be at F4, 24 mm -hmm. frames per second, whatever, and then you can go add on ND filters to achieve the desired look that you're going because for. Because in the middle of the day, let's talk about it. Say yeah. you wanted to shoot someone at F2.8. That's a lot of light. A lot of light you're letting in. And you also are shooting video at 24 frames per second. So that's one over 48. That's also a lot of light. That's pretty 
kind of slow light. shutter. Yeah. And even if your ISO is at 100, it's going to be bright as shit in the middle of the day. That blown shot out. is going to be just, just blown white. Out. Not completely usable. white. But if you want to do that and you don't want to crank the shutter because that'll ruin the, the frame rate, the motion, you don't want to crank the aperture because you really want to shoot at f2.8, put an ND filter on, ND, I'm going to guess, middle of the day, six. Mm-hmm. Let's use oh, six ops of dude, ND. Good nice. guess. And, and then you'll actually be able to shoot like a properly exposed image with the shallow depth of field in the middle of the day. And that's really important, dude. It's really important. Use ND filters, people. I didn't realize how big of a how big yeah. of a purchase that thing was because it's like, it's a hundred to like three or four hundred bucks to drastically It look. changes like the video. It's, you know, it and I, did, I didn't realize it because you see like pro guys on YouTube and right. shit and you're like watching them and I'm like, dude, we're shooting the same daytime shit right. and your stuff looks 70 times yeah. better. It's because of they're it using, they're using those filters and they look a lot cleaner and they're able to keep uh, the 180 degree shutter rule. So right. it looks natural to like what our eyes put, seeing. And put NDs on your GoPros kids. It, it changes all drones, yeah. GoPros, you get motion blur on GoPros. Then in the middle of the day on when you're skiing, cause it's bright as shit when you're skiing, it looks really cool. Mm. Also, if you're spending a good amount of money on a lens and you're investing in a lens, don't cheap out and get a $20 ND filter so off of fair. Amazon. Yeah, don't. Like get the Peter McKinnon Polar, Polar Pro. Pro. Like spend the extra money because you it's don't want to put a cheap accessory on top of a expensive par- piece of glass. It'll fuck totally. up like the, it'll make it not as sharp. It'll make it weird color, etc. Um, I always tell people never buy twice because mm-hmm. what's the point of buying the crappy ND filter right. and then, you know, use it for a few months and you're like, oh, I want the nice one now. And then right. you spend the 400 on top of the, 30 or whatever that you had to spend the first time. So just save your bread, figure out what you want, and then attack and make the purchase. Another filter that's really important. <laughs> attack and make the purchase. Is if you're shooting cars, and it's, it's important for all this stuff like real estate, but you need one if you're shooting cars, is a circular polarizer, a CPL. Basically, you spin it and it takes off reflections. Don't ask me why. It's like a polarized sunglasses and you need it if you're shooting a car or else it'll just see like ugly reflections and the car does not look cool. It also fucks like you change it and you actually see like the true color of the car because it's not like reflecting weird shit. It's really important and you need it every time. First time you showed me that, my mind was blown. I was like, yeah, this is crazy how it's, it's working. It's pretty nuts. And so like, say you're even shooting real estate and there's like a glare coming from the window on like the hardwood floors. You can take it out with circular polarizer and it looks super clean. Game set match. Really important. You can also take it off of someone driving a car if it's not supposed to be them. Right, yeah. You can make the windshield <laughs> just look dark as shit. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> Never done that before. Though. It's pretty crazy. Um, some, some final tips that I really just wanted to run through as I was thinking about this today. Um, probably the most important tip that I can give to you is like turning the camera on is really important, right? You should always turn it on, charge your batteries. Cause if you don't have charge batteries, you won't be able to turn on the port camera, which again is the most important part. Um, put an SD cam card in the camera, which is really important. I think we've all messed that up Night before. before, huh? Um, yeah. And format it, format it, charge the batteries, turn the camera on. It's usually a dial on the top, sometimes on the side. What did Tarantino say about turning the camera on? Oh, shit. Well, he said... He said I couldn't make the movie if I didn't turn it on. (laughs) (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the 505 Pod. Make sure to take a screenshot, lob it up on your story, tag the boys, and we'll see you guys all next time. Peace. Peace. Peace.